Welcome back to Today with Dr. K. I'm Dr. K. Wise Whitehead. I'm joined now by Congressman Kwaesian Fume, who serves the residents of Maryland's 7th District, which include Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Howard County. Good morning, Congressman and Fume. How are you? I am doing great. Thank you very much for having me back. I appreciate it. Thank you. So we have a lot we want to talk to you about today. We want to talk about the state of America. We want to talk about the future of Black America. We want to talk about what's happening with the Henrietta Lacks works that you're doing. And just how do we go forward from here uh, right before we end off 2020? So I want to begin um, by talking about Mm COVID-19. Millions of Americans are in need of financial relief due to what has been happening with the pandemic. Beginning at 5 p.m. today here in Baltimore City, Mayor Brandon Scott has closed down just about everything. Uh, Indoor, outdoor seating, you can still get carry out. African-Americans in the Latinx community is being hit exceptionally hard. Why do you think it's taking so long for Congress to provide some type of relief and where are we with that now? Well, it's a very good question. It's taken so long because Senator Mitch McConnell, who is the majority leader on the Senate side, uh, has not moved a bill that we sent to him five months ago to provide the relief. It's called the HEROES Act. It was $3 trillion worth of funding uh, for direct payments in, to individuals, for money for, for uh, mortgage forbearance, monies for jobs, for unemployment insurance, monies to replace ventilation systems in schools so that teachers and students could return, money for testing treatment uh, of of this disease, and monies that would go back into the economy to stabilize small businesses to continue to generate a circular flow of income in our communities. McConnell didn't like the bill. He thought it was too much money, and so he announced the day that we passed it in the House, and Nancy Pelosi sent it over to him. He announced it was dead on arrival. Well, he hasn't moved in five months from that position. And then last week, a group of moderate Democrats and Republicans in his Senate got together and pulled together a compromise package, which is $908 billion. So it's a little less than a third of what the original bill was. There's been some resistance from the White House on this and some resistance from Mr. McConnell because he wants to make sure that in the bill there are protections uh, so that people cannot bring legal charges or claims against businesses that did not do anything to protect their environment and ultimately they got COVID. So that kind of uh, position is uh, just anti all that we wanted to do in this bill. It's something that McConnell has stood steadfast on and it's another reason why, in my opinion, there has to be democratic control of the Senate because nothing is moving under a Republican led Senate by Mitch McConnell. I'm glad you said that because I know that we are coming up on uh, the runoff in Georgia and trying to express to people uh, down in Georgia why this is so important. You touched on it just a little bit, but can you explain to people what what it even means to flip the Senate and how that's going to move things forward? Well, um, the Senate, as we all know, is 100 members uh, in terms of its total population, two from each state. And to be able to control the Senate, you need a majority. If you don't have a majority and the Senate is 50-50, as it would be if the two Democrats that are running in Georgia were to win, then on every vote, the tiebreaker goes to whoever the vice president is. So the vice president in this case would be Kamala Harris, uh, where there are ties in the Senate on significant pieces of legislation, rather for the legislation to die, the vice president by constitutional directive would cast the tie-breaking vote. So it'd be important from the Democratic perspective to win both seats in Georgia, because winning one only makes it a 51-49 margin. Um, But that's the reason why this is so crucial. And it's really, uh, it's sad that we have to get down to partisan politics, but Mitch McConnell has got so many bills on his desk that he refuses to move. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is there. The John Lewis Voter uh, Fairness Act is there. The COVID relief package, as we just mentioned, has been there for five months. And so we just need a different sense of leadership that feels people, feels their pain, and understands that government, at the very least, has to do something to take care of their situations. We're getting ready to get hit, Dr. K, at the end of this month with a tsunami of evictions. We're getting ready to be hit with foreclosures like nothing we've seen before on persons' properties because they cannot 
continue to pay their mortgage or to pay it on time. We already know that the unemployment benefits have dried up in this country. And we already know that we don't have enough money for testing uh, and treatment and tracing, not to mention monies for small businesses to be able to open their doors, even in a limited capacity. So it's very important that the Congress of the United States, I would hope this coming week, passes the compromise. And uh, Vice President Biden or President-elect Biden has said, we should see that as a down payment, not an end all be all. And I couldn't agree with him more because again, it's only a third of what we sent to the Senate last uh, spring in terms of the HEROES Act. Now with everything that you've laid out, um, there, there's a feeling of despair that, that America at this moment is standing on the precipice of, of falling into an abyss, whether it's with what's happening with COVID-19 and the numbers, 15 million people plus are positive, over 290,000 Americans have died, the eviction crisis, the people who are temporarily experiencing homelessness. Can you talk with us, Congressman and Fumé, from where you sit, what is the future of America? Are we going to be able to turn this around? I think we're going to turn it around. The question becomes how many casualties do we have between now and the day that it turns around? Some of those casualties will be medical casualties, people who are dying as a result of this wicked disease that has been with us now for nine or 10 months. Some of those casualties are going to be people who have unfortunately uh, committed suicide because of the pressures that are on them and on their families. We see what's happening in terms of mental health and the numbers of people that are finding themselves with severe mental health disease. We see what's happening with domestic violence as people who continue to have less freedom of movement take it out on their spouses or take it out unfortunately on their children. And we see what's happening in terms of the ability of people just to provide for themselves when there is no money, when the unemployment insurance runs out and the direct government checks stop, which they have, uh, people then have to find other means and they will find other means to provide for their families. We don't wanna see increases in crime or suicide or spousal abuse or, or anything, but we are seeing those aggregated casualties. So we're going to get out of it. The question becomes, how do we minimize the negative impact on so many people who by no reason of their own find themselves in this situation? You know, yesterday, uh, just on the COVID side, uh, 3,100 people died. That was yesterday. The president did not say a word about that, not a condolence, not anything. And so we can't look in that direction for help. We have to look in this case for the vaccine and the ability of the vaccine to get things under control over the next several months. But there will be casualties if we don't get this relief package out uh, and they will be spread all over the society. With that in mind, I just wanted to ask you, we, we had uh, Dr. Fauci on our show last week and we were specifically specifically talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the Black and the Latinx and Indigenous communities, how we're being disproportionately impacted as you lay out these numbers. If you could, as someone who has a long eye of history, who has been a former president of the NAACP, uh, who has an idea of what's happening with, with the, the racial uh, temperature of this country, what is the state of Black America to narrow it down just a bit? Well, it is a uh, state of despair and hope that almost coexist at the same time. The despair is what we see around us every day uh, that is irrefutable, that is verifiable, and that we can measure. There's a pain gauge. We can all measure the amount of pain in our communities. Uh, some of that has to do with economics. Some of it has to do with this ugly uh, racist attitude that so many people in this country have that's sometimes condoned at the highest levels of our government. Some of it has to do with the fact that people can't predict or see their way out. So there is real despair. And that despair is in most communities where you have significant levels of poverty in most communities uh, that feel like they have been set upon. The hope that sort of coexists at the same time comes from the belief that a lot of people have in themselves and in each other and in their God. And they believe that no matter what, 
if they could just hold on and hang, hold out, that things will in fact change as they have for us so many times throughout the course of our history in this country. That coexistence is interesting and it says to me at least that no matter what side of the divide we're on, something has to be done. So if you have hope, your hope has to be rewarded with something. And if you have great despair, your despair has to be ended by doing something or providing something. Now, which, me, which leads me, of course, to talk about Henrietta Lacks. I mean, this is for a lot of African-Americans in this country, when they talk about their concern around the virus, their concern around the vaccine, they look at the ways in which our bodies, Black bodies, have been used in inhumane ways, from what happened with Tuskegee to the experimentation on Black women during the period of American slavery, and then Henrietta Lacks. And so you have brought Henrietta Lacks and her story back to the table, back to the floor, in a sense. Can, can you talk a bit about that work? Yeah, and Mrs. Lacks, whose portrait is behind me uh, is just a remarkable, remarkable woman with a story that is unlike, quite, quite frankly, anything that medical science has seen before. Ms. Lax uh, and her husband left Roanoke, Virginia in 1941. They moved to Baltimore County uh, in a community known as Turner Station and lived there at 713 New Pittsburgh Avenue trying to make ends meet. She has five children. And uh, like everybody else in that community, uh, found themselves in an area where there were higher cancer rates. Some people will say it was due to the carcinogens that were spewed out by Bethlehem Steel. Others will say that there were just no environmental protections for that community at the time. Interestingly enough, uh, Ms. Lax and my mother lived uh, within a few blocks of one another and knew one another. And Ms. Lax and her family, uh, particularly her children, her son, Sonny, and others, I all grew up with. And so the Henrietta Lacks story is personal to me in many respects, having grown up in Turner Station as I did and having learned of this story. Ms. Lacks in 1951, 10 years later, developed cervical cancer. She went to Johns Hopkins, uh, which is one of several, a few hospitals at the time in Baltimore where black people could actually go in and get a treatment in an emergency room. The others were Provident Hospital and City Hospital. City was for the indigent people in our community, which is where I was born. She went in, uh, they took cultures from her cancerous cell, but they also took cultures from other cells in her body without her knowledge and without her permission. The researcher there studied those cells as Ms. Lax continued to get worse and ultimately die from her cancer. The researcher remarked that he had never seen anything like her cells before because out of her body, up until the time of her death, they doubled every 24 hours. And then after her death, they continued to double as they are doing this very day as we speak. Those cells were so miraculous that they were used to create and develop a number of vaccines. Dr. Jonas Salk, who's credited with having developed the polio vaccine, had a vaccine which was not that strong, but had enough sense to test it against these miraculous cells only to find unique ways as a result of the interaction with the cell on how to strengthen the vaccine and finally came out with a vaccine for polio. There've been 110,000 research studies using these cells of Mrs. Lacks. And um, some people have won Nobel prizes for their research in chemistry and medicine. It's an amazing story. I mean, just unbelievable. Uh, this bill that passed on the floor yesterday that I led is a bill that was originally introduced by my predecessor, the late Elijah Cummings. Elijah and several members of the Maryland delegation and the Congressional Black Caucus sponsored this. But when he passed, that legislation, like all legislation, dies with you. Um, a part of what I wanted to do as I campaigned, as I said before, was to pick up on Elijah's legacy and to finish out some things that he never could. And so this bill, the Henrietta Lacks uh, Research Act, was just a perfect fit for me. So I got permission from the House of Representatives to reintroduce and reauthor and sort of take control of the bill as its chief sponsor. We got it uh, in the Appropriations Act through the Energy and Commerce Committee. And then two nights ago, got it out on the floor of the House of Representatives for a vote. Uh, the bill passed 
Uh, it's in the appropriations bill, so it doesn't have to pass the Senate. Uh, it becomes an act, a piece of law here uh, for all of us. But more importantly, what it does, it gets back to the heart of your question. Research is so very important in terms of developing vaccines. And many black people in this country are leery of that kind of research because of our history. We saw how slaves were uh, operated on and experimented on throughout the course of slavery. And then just in 1932, the United States Public Health Service okayed a study in Tuskegee, Alabama, where 600 black men without their knowledge or their permission were injected with syphilis and allowed to get worse and to eventually die. That is one of the most shameful events in this history of this nation because it took place with the sanction of the government. Uh, we believe, I do at least, that that's been one of the reasons why we don't participate in clinical trials. Participation by black people is very, very low. Now, a clinical trial is the trial that develops a vaccine for a virus or a disease. But in order to have the best developed vaccine, you have to make sure that the participants in the DNA of everybody is a part of that. Otherwise, if it's going to be a basically white pool, you're going to get a vaccine that deals primarily with eradicating the disease, mostly in white people with no guarantee that it will happen with others because our DNA is not a part of the uh, clinical trials. This act, uh, again, the Enhancing Cancer Research Act, uh, hopes to draw attention back to Mrs. Lax, her, her HELI cells, and by the way, they're called HELI because H-E is for Henrietta and L-A is for Lax, is a way to get people focused again, primarily because we've got these vaccines being developed now for COVID. And in each one of those, whether it's the Pfizer trial, the Madeira trial, or the AstraZeneca trial, the level of Black partition is, participation is low. So that, that's, for me, that's kind of scary and frightening. So I'm trying to find a way through this act, obviously, and thank you for this chance to talk so much about it, to get people focused again back on our bodies, our health, our ability to have science work for us, and to focus on a woman whose miraculous cell has led the way for so many vaccines and other things to occur. Now, before I talk with you about how we can convince um, more Black people, you know, our brothers, our sisters, our fathers, uh, you know, our mothers, our, our cousins, how we can convince them to be a part of this study, has the family of Henrietta Lacks received any type of compensation? When you talk about 110,000 you know, papers and trial studies and Nobel Peace Prizes and everything from polio to probably even the work they're doing with COVID-19, how is her family doing? Well, I don't know how much her family may have received in monetary compensation or if they received anything at all. I do know that Johns Hopkins admitted many, many years ago the era of their ways and has tried to find a way to funnel money into research under the name of Henrietta Lacks. I do know that the National Institutes of Health, uh, which I think have been granted by the family the right to control the usage of the cell, I, I don't wanna misspeak here, but the National Institutes of Health have, have been working also in that, that regard. But in terms of monetary compensation, I don't know. Uh, this has been such a hidden story. Thank God for the book. Thank God for Oprah Winfrey's movie on this. Thank God for Elijah having the insight to start a legislative effort toward this that we've just finished up. Um, but we've got to find a way to, to tell more people about it. But I don't and cannot speak uh, in terms of monetary compensation that, that may have gone to the family over the years. There have been a number of traditional things. Morgan State University uh, gave Ms. Lacks an honorary degree several years back, several other colleges and universities have done that. There've been great books written, as I said, 110,000 research papers, but monetary compensation, I, I don't know. I don't know what that dollar amount is. Right, and sometimes my heart just thinks about things like that in terms of being able to, to benefit the people because Henry Lax has benefited herself without her permission have benefited all of us. Mm -hmm. How do we get more black people to participate in the trial study, even before we can convince them to take the vaccine? Which is, which is a hurdle right now, to even think about taking the vaccine. How do we get them to, to trust science at this point? Um, I think persons who are in positions of 
authority or leadership or respect or reverence have to believe themselves, number one, in the ability of clinical trials when they are integrated the right way. They come up with the right medications to stand up and to, to speak about that. Uh, and so whether it's a faith leader or a political leader or an academic leader or leaders in media, or wherever else, uh, people are going to want to wait and see who else feels that way. Is it just the drug makers or are there people within our community? Which is why I commend Freeman Rabowski, Dr. Freeman Rabowski and his wife, Jackie, over at the uh, University of Maryland in Baltimore County uh, for, uh, well, I guess about three weeks ago, agreeing to take the vaccine, to take it on camera and to say it's great and it will work. Uh, and we want to be the first to show you that, that we will do this. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is to recognize the wall that we're up against in terms of cancer. Uh, breast cancer in black women, three to four times the national average. Prostate cancer in black men, five or six times the national average. Cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, hypertension, diabetes, HIV, full-blown AIDS. The list is too long. And we are affected in disproportionate ways. Not only do we have some of those morbidities, some of us have comorbidities. So we're suffering from diabetes and hypertension at the same time, or heart disease and kidney disease at the same time. We've got to know that those things are not going to go away on their own. They're only going to go away through proper treatment, early treatment and assessment, number one, which we all have to do. Make sure that we are getting early examinations uh, to the extent that we can. And then to make sure that when we are dealing with a medicine that we take the medicine, but more importantly, when there's an opportunity to get a vaccine that we believe, many of us believe is different from other vaccines because this vaccine does not inject the virus into you like a flu vaccine does. This is made with a different genetic code which tells your body to create uh, the sort of antibodies and the resistance that it needs to, to ward off the disease. So that in and of itself, I would hope should make some people feel a little more comfortable because when we think about vaccines, whether it's a polio vaccine or, or a, a flu vaccine, as I said, or anything else, they're injecting the virus back in you in hopes that the virus will trigger what has to be done. These two or three vaccines, the first three do not do that. But more importantly, we've just got to recognize that uh, we're up against that wall as a people. Our life expectancy uh, is demonstrably lower than other groups. Our quality of life, unfortunately, in too many instances is demonstrably lower um, and that we deserve to live longer and to live healthier and better lives so that we're able to see our children and their children and others grow up uh, and be a part of what we had. And that was a good full life. But really needs to be a much longer life. And that longevity has to come about, it will come about through better health approaches. And so my last two questions to you, um, the first one more broad and then the second one will be more personal. But, but from a broad perspective, uh, you, you've laid out the challenges that, that black people have in this country and have, have historically had going all the way back uh, to slavery. And, and we found ways to overcome, like we've tapped into that faith and that hope. Uh, for people of, of my father's generation, I think about my dad who's in his 70s. He said on average, he's lost someone every week this year that he knows to COVID-19. And so there's a generation, uh, our, our baby boomers, who are feeling overwhelmed. What, what kind of word would you give to them to just to be able to hold on once again? Well, being one of those baby boomers, um, <laughs> we learned at an early age that, that baby boomers don't have expiration dates which is why so many of us still work and still do all the other things that people assume you ought not do when you hit your 70s, that you ought to retire. But I understand uh, his experience because every week I hear somebody else that has also transitioned because of COVID. Um, I've gone to at least three, four funerals a month uh, for a long time now. Some of those are just funerals of persons who expired, but others are funerals of persons who've been ill and could not fight off this wicked disease and succumbed as a result of that. Um, I don't know that I have advice to people who are in my generation. I mean, we kind of look at each other and you know, our mantra is just hunker down, do the right thing, 
uh, keep God in front of you, take care of yourself, believe you're going to make it out of this and be strong. Um, I came up in an era where a lot of these medicines didn't exist. I'm 72 years old. So we relied more on home remedies, but home remedies are not going to get you out of COVID. Uh, the right vaccine will, but home remedies and the idea of hunkering down and believing that you're going to beat this will get you to a point, I think, where um, this whole notion of mental illness does not affect this generation, the baby boomers in the same way, this notion of suicide doesn't affect us in the same way, but the level of pain and loss does, because you hate to see people go who were part of the era and the time that you grew up in, and they're leaving left and right. And then my last question is just to speak to the, the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, I'm part of the sandwich generation where I have my father. And then, of course, I have my you know, zillennial sons who are saying I'll be first in line for the vaccine. And I, I think I hear them asking every day there's an emergency about a place they just have to go to. Right. And so mm -hmm. that generation where you know, it, it's hard to understand what it means to hunker down when you really haven't been through some of the things that my father has talked about. Right. Jim Crow taught you how how to hunker down and keep God in front of you. What would be your advice? If it's one of our elders who has walked a long path here, what would you, your advice be to our, our teens and our young 20s who don't really seem to understand that this is actually something you can carry and actually kill somebody with? Because they're, they're bouncing back from it, many of them. Yeah, you're right. Um, I've got six sons who ultimately had sons and daughters. So I've got nine grandkids who are who range uh, from two to about 20, and none of them believe that this is as serious as those of us who've lived a little longer do. And what I've said to them is that we all were your age before, and I know this doesn't make sense, and you've never gone through anything like this, but I don't want you to think about yourself. I want you to think about your mother, your father, your aunt, your uncle, your grandparents, parents and to recognize they're not as strong as you against this virus and to recognize that although you are giving up a few things like you didn't graduate and have a prom this year uh, or you're tired of doing fifth grade studies in your room on a computer or you are 13 and you want to go out and have a, a good time you you just can't do that right now but don't and this is what I say don't look at it as something that's penalizing you, look at what you do now as a way of helping your family, helping all of them, all of us to live longer. And uh, when you put that responsibility back on them, it's amazing how many of them take that to heart. And then they start thinking about it in a different way, like it's really not about me, but it's about, about my Aunt Lily, it's about my Uncle Mike, it's about my grandma, my papa, uh, now, let me just say this, we can't do that forever, which is why I'm really hoping that this is now starting, I hate to use the word, turn the curve like somebody does at the White House, but I hope it's starting to get to the point where it will be resolving itself soon based on the availability of this vaccine and the ability of people to do the things until they get the vaccine to keep them alive. Because even with young people, I mean, you can tell them that for a while, but you can't do that for two years. They're just not going to buy it. And I understand that. And we all were at that that age where, you know, how can I put this? We just thought we were going to live forever. Yeah. Um, so the sooner we're out of this, the better. It's a tough task for parents, uh, for children, and for grandparents. Congressman Kwaisi and Fume, it has been an honor and uh, a privilege to speak with you. Uh, Congressman Fume serves the residents of Maryland's 7th District, which includes Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Howard County. Thank you so much for your work, and thank you for your words today. Thank you, and we all together thank Mrs. Henrietta Lacks, yes. a miraculous woman who gave us the miraculous cell that has just saved hundreds of thousands of lives, and will continue to do that as long as it continues to duplicate every 24 hours outside of her body. Thank you very much. Thank you. And folks, so stay with us. When we return, let's continue our conversation about how we go forward from here.